It's time back. You gotta move. Down, down. Come on. You can... Oh, yes, you can go sit over there. Oh, <laughs> come on, Pop. Up, 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 up. Up, up. Come on. Good boy. Thank you, Steinbeck. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Cameras and Coffee, where today... Um, not specific news, but I've been thinking about what the camera industry looks like today. What sort of legacy things are still hanging around that don't need to anymore. And I got to thinking, the shooting modes that we all know, program, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, time and aperture value priority for Pentax shooters, completely obsolete. We'll get to that in a second because the other thing, because I got to thinking about that because I was thinking of if a camera company came to me and said, hey, we're handing you our brand management plan. Tell us what you think we should do with it. Well, what I got to wondering was how many different tiers of camera each company has. Now, looking at some of the major digital camera production companies, let me pull up the stats I sent myself to make sure I get them correct. As of today in 2020, Canon has 18, 1 8 tiers of different digital camera on the market listed as in production on Wikipedia. Nikon has 8, Pentax 4, Sony has 10 in E mount and 3 in A mount, Fuji has 11, Olympus has 6, and Panasonic also has 6. Not a comprehensive list of every digital camera maker, but capturing is, I think, the big ones. So really interesting in that are a couple of them. Pentax has four with the, almost caught it, almost caught it, Puppo. Pentax has the least with four, uh, and Sony has 13 with both of their mounts com combined. Now Pentax, oh, so some interesting things, Pentax has the least at four. Three of them are K-mount, one of those is full frame, two are APS-C, and one of them is medium format, the Z, the 645Z. Um, but interestingly, I think in these are Canon, which has 18, just a, a ludicrous number of cameras uh, across multiple mounts, admittedly, and, then, um, and multiple formats. And then Sony, which has 13 across two different mounts, and two different formats, full frame and APS-C. So the two biggest companies have tons and tons and tons of tiers of camera. And that seems counterintuitive to me because if I was handed a company's brand management plan, I would look at it much more simply. I would make it very easy for consumers to pick the camera they want. I think the idea that there are so many different tiers is, is an illusion of choice, not an actual choice, especially because a lot of those different tiers within those companies, the cameras are functionally the same just with software limitations. Um, I've been shooting the A5000 and the A7S II a lot this year. And the A5000, you can zoom in on a thing to, to verify manual focus, but then it self times out a few seconds later and goes back to your full view. Whereas the A7S II will stay zoomed in on that until you tell it not to. And for the 5000, that seems to be just a software limitation, not anything in the hardware. And there's a lot of that when you have multiple tiers of camera. So if it were me, I think I would simplify the tier system that is very complex at most of these companies. So, were it me, I would do three basic tiers, pro, advanced, and intermediate. Completely get rid of everything entry level. For the reasons we talked about last week with um, Olympus's marketing strategy appearing to completely, uh, the JIP's marketing strategy for Olympus co appearing to completely get rid of the entry level camera because Entry level is not going to compete with cell phones. So if I were in charge of a brand strategy, entry level's out the door. Okay. So intermediate, I would see as being something like an APS-C camera. 
And all of those modes and nonsense things like scene shooting, also starting with all of these out the door. Intermediate, PASM, TV, um, shutter and time priority, green box. That's what, those are the shooting modes. Things like nighttime shooting, food shooting. By the, if somebody is interested enough in photography at this point to spend the money to buy a good camera, they know what they're looking for or they are interested in expanding their skills through different settings on their own to get those looks without just going to a dial. So basically, if you, thought, if you think of something like an, a, an EOS 5D series in APS-C format, that would be the ideal intermediate type camera for me. Advanced, in my mind, would be a full frame camera of some sort, whether it's mirrorless or DSLR. But this would be full, full frame. And either this would be a super advanced full frame or medium format. So in, in Pentax, 645 K1 K3. Like that's a pretty darn good lineup for three good cameras. In Canon, it would be something like the uh, R5. What's their new one that came out with the APS-C? I'm forgetting. And then something a little bit lower. You get the idea. For those of you who know your brands very well, you'll be able to draw uh, analogous cameras between each of these tiers. So that would be the core of the tiers. And these sort of cameras would be produced, I would produce them for more than a, six months or a year at a time. They would be something that would be on the market for a handful of years. The pro end cameras, the longest for sure, five, six, seven year production runs, advanced three, five, six years, maybe two to three on the intermediate. And the reason for that is we're at a point now with digital sensors and digital technology where they are so good that the difference between 10 years ago, a four megapixel and a six or seven megapixel camera, huge. The difference today between a 24 and a 26 or 32 megapixel camera, not as huge. The number of megapixels is different, but what functionally makes a digital camera significantly better than a previous generation isn't the sensor anymore. It's the software that backs it up and the interface that backs it up. So if you have a camera that's a 20 megapixel sensor and, that, and it has better algorithms behind the scenes than a 24 megapixel sensor or a 36 megapixel sensor camera, that 20 megapixel camera is gonna give you better images. So that's why you now going forward, digital cameras could have a longer production run, especially because firmware updates, if the R&D goes into them well, could eke more out of those sensors as the programmers learn more of what they're capable of. I remember um, when I was a kid, Nintendo was always putting more and more onto their game cartridges as over time, the software engineers learned how much more data they could actually fit onto the different game cartridges. And that would be the exact same principle here. Sensors can almost certainly give more than what the software engineers are aware of when they first release the camera. And over time, tweaking algorithms and learning more about capabilities could absolutely improve the performance of the cameras. So that would be my first step right there is to have those three core tiers forming the backbone of a camera lineup. And then I'd add a fourth tier. Ah, ah. I would call this the experimental tier, and this would be things like different interfaces, different technologies, things that are being tried out that you could say, let's sink our R&D budget into this as an R&D loss leader, and then on paper make these tiers more profitable because these will be using technologies which are proven in the experimental tier. And releasing a new experimental camera every 18 to 24 months on a pretty fast cycle to test out these new technologies that you're evaluating for these higher tier cameras would be a good way to um, funnel new approaches and innovations upward through your tiers. So let's say, for instance, that 
you know in four years you're going to release a new pro camera and in three years you're going to release a new advanced camera. Then you've got one to two experimental camera cycles in that time to try out new things and get the kinks work out, worked out of the system. So what do I mean by experimental? And what got me thinking about all of this stuff, going back to the very beginning, is how outmoded program aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, green box, all of that stuff is completely obsolete now. And it only hangs on because there hasn't been another paradigm shift in photography. During the film era, everything was fully manual until somebody said, hey, you know, if we take this Electro Spotmatic and we put the, a little bit of software in here, we can use the meter reading off of the CDS cell to inform the shutter speed based on the aperture and the available light. And all of a sudden, the spot, the, the Pentax had, or a, uh, yeah, Pentax had invented aperture priority. I think that was the first, if I remember correctly, the ES, the Electro Spotmatic was the first aperture priority. Well, then somebody said, oh, hey, what if we did that with the shutter speed? What if we said, let's input the shutter speed and now calculate the aperture based on that? And now shutter priority was born. And then later when the technology advanced enough, what if the camera just does both of those? And program mode was born. And then everything beyond that was just a refinement or outgrowth of those four modes. So fundamentally, PASM allow you to control aperture, shutter speed, and now with digital cameras, sensitivity. So it's that triangle that you've seen everywhere. So what if you had a completely different camera interface? All right, so bear with me and my terrible drawing here. Let's pretend that, let's pretend that this is the top of a camera, okay? And over here you have your rear command dial and your front command dial. These are pretty standard on most every camera, especially once you get up to the intermediate and advanced level that you can buy today. You can set one of these to adjust the shutter speed and one of these to adjust the aperture, okay? What if we added another dial over here? And this one was just for ISO, okay? So now your full manual mode you adjust the shutter speed, you adjust the aperture, you adjust your own ISO. Well, you have three switches up here. These are these little tiny boxes or switches. And it would be one direction is auto and the other direction would be manual. So ISO, aperture, shutter speed in some order. ISO is automatic. Now you've got your auto, your, your automatic ISO, but you're controlling aperture and shutter speed. Well, ISO is automatic, shutter speed is automatic, aperture is manual, now you're shooting in aperture priority mode. Flip the aperture switch over to automatic, shutter speed to manual, now you're shooting in shutter priority mode. So one of those types of things that I would think of for, the, for an experimental tier would be looking at different, uh, pr different paradigms for what a camera interface could be. Eliminate things like that mode nonsense. Get it out of the photography vernacular. Instead, focus on different concepts about interface potentials. That would be a big design shift for me. And if I were, if I were in charge of a company's brand strategy, I would say get away from this idea and innovate in this manner. Try it out. Release a camera that has an interface like this and see if people like it. And I think the answer would be yes, because I think saying you have three things you can control, which gives you functionally nine combinations of different settings that you can adjust, um, that would give you way more control than PASM. If you set your ISO to manual, and your aperture and shutter speed to automatic, now you're shooting in traditional program mode. If you set all of them to automatic, you're shooting in green box mode and any combination thereof. If you set your ISO to automatic and your shutter speed to manual and your aperture to automatic, now you're shooting in time and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you set your, set your ISO and shutter speed to manual, 
Now you're shooting in time and sensitivity priority. So um, at any rate, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest things holding back for camera companies today is the lack of asking what have we done for the last 40 years that can be different? Because fundamentally, in many, many important ways, digital cameras today are not meaningfully different to use than film cameras. Many of them have interfaces very similar to the last generation of film cameras. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be much, much simpler. And um, so at any rate, my advice to photography companies would be to ask what truths over the last 40 years have we taken for granted that we shouldn't. And let's not be afraid to kill any of our darlings because every single assumption about what should be done should be questioned. So I guess what I would like to hear from you is what sort of innovative ideas would you like to see camera companies do in their next generations of cameras? What, th what ideas have you had rattling around in your head about what a camera could be that it's not? So as always, I look forward to reading your comments because I read all of them and um, look forward to hearing your ideas about what cameras could be that today they are not. Have a good day, everybody. And guess what, Steinbeck? Guess what? Okay, you already know. Let's go for a walk. Have a good day.